with us from Jerusalem and Trader. <laughs> Asher and Trader. <laughs> you ever just go blank? It's like you're in this holy place and now what's his last name? <laughs> I know your name, Asher. And we are very glad to have you with us and very blessed that Betty is along with you as well. So come and open the word to us again tonight. Hi again. <laughs> and I'll say the same thing I said this morning. It's lots of fun and a real blessing to be with you and we love you. Amen. And I also want to say again that we love you and appreciate you so much. I was saying to Linda that I might have been in that first offering in 2004 that I was a speaker, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and, um, but anyway, I really, I so appreciate you. I appreciate um, your hunger for the Lord, your willingness to go out for anything in the Holy Spirit and not be embarrassed about it. Just go for it. And I'm always surprised when I'm with you that things I've been working through for a while, understanding with the Lord, I come to you and you're like right at the same place. And we came from totally different areas. And I uh, just want to tell you that we love you and appreciate you. We're doing a two-part series today on the book of Revelation. The first one was based on uh, Revelation 11:15, the seventh trumpet saying the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And tonight, we're going to talk about, uh, based on Revelation 19, 7, which says, the bride has made herself ready. Amen. But I have a couple of things of introduction before I introduce uh, Anna and Ruth. I have two short videos for you. I'd like you to clue up the first one on the alignment book. There's only a 60-second a uh, video. Uh, our book on the alignment, which has... Uh, a good part about a glow in it and a good part about the global family with David Demian and of course with our family at Tikkun and my friend Dan Jester with Ben here today. But it has a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of things written out that we're kind of explaining here. It might be a good thing for you to get if you want some more explanation. So let's roll that video if we have it. A little under 10 years ago, I was praying and um, fasting and praying, and all of a sudden, the Lord spoke this word into me, alignment. The whole process, what God is doing with this international ecclesia is coming to its fullness as we get close to the second coming of Yeshua. But when we get into this right alignment, boom. Something big is happening, and to tell you the truth, it is happening. Things are happening all over the world, and we want you to be a part of it. We feel this is paving the way uh, for the coming of the kingdom of God. Alignment, that's our book. Amen. This is a re-edition of the book that came out a few years ago. So the second thing I want to show you... Uh, a video about one of the members of our team in Jerusalem. With this new government, there's been an increase of some persecution against Messianics in the land. Just want to give you a little taste of it because she's also talking about who we are as a body. And this is uh, uh, Rachel Smilovich talking from our team there. Protesting is becoming more and more frequent here in the land and there was just chaos, total chaos. It became violent and I started shaking. We had about five or six other guys yelling and screaming and trying to become physical. I looked at him and I said, what about what's happening here? I recently attended a worship concert where Messianic worship artists 
sang new and old worship songs. When I arrived there, there were a lot of protesters. As I was entering the building, I could hear yelling and screaming and they were blowing whistles and it was very loud. Once I make it to the bottom of the staircase, this guy literally jumps like over the wall and the cops jump on him and they make an arrest. And everybody starts running towards this guy and there was just chaos, total chaos. It became violent and I started shaking. It was a very, very scary thing to witness. I hadn't witnessed this so up close. And as I make it down, to where we were meeting, where the concert was taking place, the officer approached me and a few others and said, I'm sorry, you cannot go in right now. There is no way. And so there was a guy that he kept staring at me and I guess he was wondering if I was part of the group and I told him, yes, I wanna go in. He said, why? And then we started talking from there. The first question he asked me was if I was a Jew. I told him, yes, I am a Messianic Jew and I believe in Yeshua. Obviously, he was in shock and he was more angry. That brought more fuel to the fire, which is something that you do not do as a Jewish ultra-Orthodox. But one thing that was um, interesting was the fact that he threw the word respect and honor. I looked at him and I said, you want to talk about respect and honor? What about what's happening here? Do you think that this is respectful to us? What's happening here? Do you call this honoring each other? And I said, listen, we honor and respect you guys when you worship and you praise, you know? And one thing that you guys should know is that, I mean, it's illegal to stop somebody from worshiping here in Israel. That is something that you cannot do. And they were literally stopping us from going to worship. So that's something that you do not do. And I felt like personally, I overcame that and the Holy Spirit guided me throughout the whole conversation. I was not afraid. We kept talking. I kept telling him who I was and what I believed in. I told him that this is not Yeshua. You know, they kept talking about the missionaries, the missionaries, they're here to convert. They're evil, they're bad. But what they don't know is that many Christians love Israel and they stand with Israel. And this is something that I try to tell him and they just, they, they're uneducated. You know, they don't know the truth. And I kept telling them, you cannot tie us to these missionaries. This is not who we are. This is not who Yeshua is. There is definitely a hundred percent a veil. They are so blinded. They were trying to quote me scripture. And I said, what about Isaiah 53? Have you read about Isaiah 53 that talks about the Messiah? And they're like, no, 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 no. That is not the Messiah. I mean, it can be exhausting because you say one point, then they come at you with another point. But at the end of it, the guy was furious. He was angry. So it was interesting to see the different points of view where they're all standing and how they see things different. And one of the things that I really was sensing is that we as the body, the remnant here, need to, need to be strong, need to be strengthened in order to go out and to evangelize and to share about Yeshua, to not be afraid. We have a responsibility to witness. And I personally, from this experience, felt that it was saying, okay, Rachel, now that you've experienced this, it's kind of like a step closer now to start even sharing more and more. So one thing that I would say is that us as a body, what we need is prayer and prayer for boldness, that we would not be afraid, that we will be able to go. In order for Israel to be completely saved, we need to go out and to share about Yeshua. My name is Raquel Smilovich. I am part of the remnant. Yeshua is my Messiah. Amen. So we would, all of us on behalf of all of the Messianic believers in Israel, we really appreciate your prayers. It's right that the level of persecution is going up, but we don't see those people as our enemies. These are our cousins. These are relatives. These are our brothers and sisters. We love them, and we feel that they are with us in, in the kingdom of God. They don't necessarily feel that same way about us, but we, but we love them, and we just want you to keep uh, praying for them. And now I have a special privilege, which is to, I want to invite Anna and Ruth Damon. Ruth, come on up with us too and we'll introduce you. Amen. Uh, you've heard me share this before. And I think actually David's been with us here at some events with, with a glow. And um, so uh, over the past nine years, since 2014, 
I work closely with a dear friend and partner, David Demian, in what, something we call the global family, and particularly in reconciliation between Arab Christians and Messianic Jews. And this is David's dear wife, Ruth, and this is his dear daughter, Anna. And uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. And uh, as I said before, I always, because we believe in the generation sharing together. Whenever I speak, I always make room for a spiritual son or daughter to come in with us. So, Anna, share your heart a little bit with us. Hallelujah. I am so honored to be here. My goodness, I feel like I walked in a different person. I really can say that. And it is my honor to be able to stand by you, Asher. I really want to say he's actually changed my life. And I don't know if you know that. <laughs> you really have I shaped. You changed my life. Oh, <laughs> he shaped me, and um, in ways that I can't really put words to. And I really want to honor you as you, a friend to my dad, and a friend to my family, and a father to me. Um, how he's shaped me is um, I actually was really closed off. I grew up in the Christian home and my dad was traveling a lot and there was a lot in me that was just like, this is crazy and I don't love this. And I saw a lot of, I felt like I saw my dad pouring his heart out and being willing to lay down his life for people, but then I saw a lot of the opposite. And you know, if they didn't agree with one thing, then they were jumping ship and vice versa in so many ways. And I was like, this just does not feel like a worthy cause this doesn't feel like Jesus, to be honest. And then I started seeing friendships like Asher and my dad's and many others. And I started seeing what it actually looks like to love one another. I started seeing them lay down their lives for one another, lay down their ministry titles, not even want to speak, let the other person speak. And I've seen that, especially in your relationship with my dad, and with, on that level, it's also like culture and heritage where they should not be friends. And they have put their lives on the line to be friends and to walk in a way that actually represents the call on our lives to love one another as he loved us so that the world would know. And I feel like I just stand as a testament to that love radically changing my life and radically making me want to give all of me again to the Lord. And it actually makes me, yeah, I, I can't hold back my tears because it's unlocked this part of me that sees people live way beyond the borders of nice words or we love you and actually put boots to the ground. And I have not only seen that in relationships, like one-on-ones, but also like people groups that again should not be even in the same room together, being willing to build a bridge instead of a wall. And I can't tell you what that's done for me and softening my heart and then also wanting to add my piece in. And one story that comes to mind is when we were about to go to Egypt for a gathering and um, one of my friends came to me and said, actually, did you know that before we came, Asher invited us all into a house together and he sat us down and he said, I want to hear what are the things that are causing walls between us still. I'm open ears. Let's not just say we're family. Let's actually live it. Let's, let's own this together. And she said, I can't even tell you what that did to me as, as an Israeli, Arab, Palestinian Christian in the land to feel like there's actually a space that they live family. And so... I just want to say, I think that when Asher asked me to share with him, I was like, what would I share other than how much what he and so many others and actually also you have done that is shaping my generation. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for showing up. And I feel like I'm in a room of people that have said yes to whatever that looks like. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel so honored to be in this room and on behalf of my generation, I want to say you are pioneering for us to stand on a different ground. And 
that ground feels so much more sturdy in the realness of what it is. I mean, we just can't do another season of nice words. I feel like the, the, the walls are too big. The chains are too strong when we talk about like conflicts in nations and we talk about deep things. They're just too strong unless we actually live it. And I'm watching it before my own eyes change me and change I know so many people in my generation that feel safe home. They want to run. They want to be. They want to be a part. They want to be a part of extending what you guys have pioneered into our generation and not let it die. And so I honor you. I thank you. I honor you, Asher, so much from my heart. And the verse that was on my heart was actually the one from um, Revelation 12. And it says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony and not loving their lives unto death. And that means unto the Lord and unto his children that we would love in that way, that we don't just even protect our own families, protect our own lives, but actually we've given ourselves fully. And that I feel will change the world and change the safety of the body for even our generation, my generation to run back Stay with me, you. you know, um, we'll stay up here with us for a sec. I just want to say that um, just a couple of things about um, my journey with your dad and with your husband, my dear friend David, that um, I remember years ago, I think I was here maybe at an Aglow conference maybe 10 years ago and taught on John 17 about us being one, if you remember that. And as we were praying about how to become one, just alone, I began to think that we had to break down all of our ministry models we, because the very way we were defining ministries was separating one another. And the only way that we could really become one with everybody in the world is, is to redefine it as a family, as a global family. And I, I came to that conclusion, and then I heard David speaking about it, and he just did it so much better than I could. I mean, not only taught about it, but what I began to learn was that there's a gift among Arab Christians, among Arabs, among Arab people, they have a family welcoming spirit. And as, and as we embraced them, embraced you, we learned how to be a family together. That was not our gift. That was something we came to the table and, and got from you. So I'm very uh, grateful for that. And then we also had another journey going on at the same time, which I've been on a journey for over 40 years on that, is understanding how, as a Jew, how do I relate to Arabs, uh, particularly as a Messianic Jew and Arab Christians. And it's been a long journey. It hasn't necessarily been easy. It's been easy about the last 10 years, thank God. It was a real breakthrough when you're when your dad and when your husband, and when, uh, we got together when we, with David and I. And, um, but I was going through a process of identifying with Abraham. Now, you've heard me say that before, but I want to say it for them too, that I was, because we are so interested, focused on praying for Jewish people to be saved. And I saw that Abraham, before Isaac could be born, Abraham's praying for a son. And he gets to the point where he has to say, let Ishmael live before you. And that happens right before Isaac comes. And I just saw the pattern of God that we had to have the heart for Abraham to pray for Is Ishmael's salvation, for the salvation revival among the Arab people before it was going to come to our people. And I said, look, this is God. This is your pattern. I mean, I'm into God's patterns, you know, alignment. And I said, this has to come first. And I remember coming to... Uh, Arab Christian leaders across the Middle East and saying to them, no, your revival has to come before it's going to come to us. And it, it was stunning. And we went through this whole process of learning how to, to share with one another and even realizing that, that the whole brotherhood and the family, but it's an amazing thing that God is doing, is healing the roots of the global family of faith, which go all the way back to the first family, which was Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, Isaac, you go back to that first family, and God is healing that, and we are testimonies of that. Thank God. So thank you. Amen. Anything else you want to share? Have you said anything? I just want to share. Actually, it really happens. Um, Asher has been with us in places probably shouldn't be 
And I remember one time you were in Egypt, Ambedi, and I don't know, maybe 2,000 Egyptians. It's not, we had to meet in the desert because it wasn't easy to have um, Messianic believers with us. But I remember as you opened your heart as a father and they felt your heart, literally, they ran. They were like crawling up on the stage. Like. Just to, to be close. And you know, in Egypt, it's a total replacement theology. It wasn't like they had heard it before, but the connection in the spirit. And then it's been in Jordan, and we were in the Emirates. And all each time, it's the same. The heart, the family, and it, then it bypasses the yeah. politics. And out of that, the kingdom really is coming. We, as you can share, I mean, we've seen the face of the politics change, and that's what we've been seeing. The kingdom is coming within the family. So, just want to honor, yes, all that you've done, and your whole team that have come out to places that maybe are not even safe, but we've watched you live it out, and we are really so honored to see it change our family, but also change nations. So thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's just stand up and say thank you for Arab Christians and for our dear Damien family. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Well, Let's uh, study a little bit in the Bible, and uh, then I want to pray with you. This message today is about the bride being glorified, and i um, really excited, and I just pray, Lord, and that, um, God, I don't have the ability to bring this to pass. Lord, I, I just ask for your words, your wisdom. Yeshua, I ask you to speak. You have something you want to say to these dear friends and to your bride. And Lord, I ask for you just to speak that and say that now. Thank you, Yeshua. Amen. Oh, we want to talk about, good, the bride has made herself ready. This is what I want to talk about. This is God's greatest artwork. And that is creating a beautiful people in a beautiful world. You know, God as a creator is an artist. And he makes beautiful things. You've seen beautiful flowers. You've seen a beautiful, a beautiful things that God makes in nature. But the most beautiful thing that God is creating as a craftsman, as an artist, is a group of people. If you can imagine a, sculpture, a sculptor that wants to sculpt a, a picture of someone or a painter that wants to paint a painting, what God wants to do, he's creating a bit of artwork. And the way he creates an artwork, it's a, it's a living piece of art. It's a group of people. It's a group of people that are beautiful, that shine with light, that are glorious. He loves them, they love him. And that's who you are. And that's what our destiny is together. Together to become the bride of Christ and to become the family of God, to be glorified in him as a global body of people. I realize that in some ways this is a simple message. It could have been said at any time. But there is something different happening in the world. In this, in this even this, just this decade, with all kinds of digital communication, even in the time of the, of the COVID disease when everyone had to turn to communicating on Zoom and in other digital ways, there, uh, something happened among believers around the world that we started communicating with people in every different nation. God did a miracle in the midst of, that, in the midst of those problems. And what happened was an awareness by true born-again believers in Yeshua all over the world Wait a minute, I have brothers and sisters in every other nation, and this is what they look like, and I can talk to them. And there began to be an awareness that we are actually becoming a global body, a global family. And this could never have happened before in any case, because there weren't Jewish believers and there weren't Arab believers. I mean, how are you going to have a global family of faith without Arab Christians and Messianic Jews? That's another thing that has happened. All this is happening right in these past few years. 
Arab Christians, Messianic Jews, them and coming together in love, digital communication around the world, our awareness of one another as a global family. I mean, come on, even every unbelieving uh, uh, corporation around, business co corporation is calling themselves a global family. Well, that's a superficial version of it, but God has something in that in a real way for us. To see there's a picture that God has in his mind that he had in his heart before he created the world. He saw this group of people. He saw you. He saw me. He saw a group of people that he thought that they were beautiful. And he wanted to glorify them and bring them together and love them so much he called them his bride. Hallelujah. Well, let's go ahead and read the first verse. From Revelation 19, 7, I'm going to actually start at the end and then work back. He says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come for his wife or his bride has made herself ready. There's a process that the people of God go through throughout the whole book of Revelation to get to the point they are ready to meet Yeshua. They are not ready. We are not ready before that happens. It's an amazing thing. This is the verse. The next verse is the return of Yeshua. The next verse is the heavens open. Yeshua comes down riding a white horse, leading the armies of, of heaven to kill all the bad guys, destroy the beast, and take, his, and take his bride. This is the last thing that has to happen. Think about that. We getting ready for him to come back is the last prerequisite for him to come. And this is why he is coming. He's waiting to come until we're ready. Because this is what he's coming for. It's not just a timing, it's a purpose. He's coming to get you and me. We're his girl. You know, this is, I wanna, I, what I want to tell you is this is the hero story. This is the hero story. I have to admit, I have a little carnal uh, hobby. I kind of like to watch action movies. I'm sorry, but you know, I just love it when the, you know, the guy comes in and he kills all the, and, but really, you know what? It's the same story every time. It's only got two parts. You kill all the bad guys and you save the beautiful girl. That's what happens, you know? And where did they get that? Because it is the story. It is the only story that there is. You can't have a heroic story if there aren't a lot of bad guys, you know. Because the hero's got to come and kill all the bad guys. But you also can't have a heroic story if there isn't a beautiful girl. I mean, what's he killing all the bad guys if he doesn't get the beautiful girl in the end? I don't know about you. Well, you probably don't. I'm the only one carnal here. But I, 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 like, I watch these shows, and you know at the beginning... What's going to happen? It's going to look like the bad guys are going to win. It looks like they're going to kill the, the, the hero. It looks like they're going to uh, uh, kidnap the beautiful girl. And somehow, in the end, he's going to get through it, and he's going to kill the bad guys and get the beautiful girl. It's the same story every single time, but I love it. You know, it's just going to, because it's the only story that there is. It's the only story that there is. And Yeshua is the hero. And the bad guys, that's obvious. That's Satan and the, and the forces of evil. But the beautiful girl is you and me. The beautiful girl is the bride of Christ. That's who he's coming back for. It's an interesting thing even to think about the word salvation. Jewish people don't get it. When you come up and try to say, you know, are you saved? Say, what are you talking about? Because that's not what the word means in the original. The word, in, in the idea of salvation in, in the Hebrew mindset is a military salvation when you're, about, when you're getting attacked and someone comes in and kills the bad guys and saves you. That's what salvation means. It doesn't mean somebody coming in to forgive you of your sins. I mean, what did that happen? We didn't get that. But they're both true. That's why Yeshua has to come twice. He saves us twice. Listen. He saves us twice. He comes the first time to save our souls individually because we have sinned and he dies upon the cross and sheds his blood so that we can be forgiven, be born again and have eternal life. But that's not the end of the story. He allows us to grow. Isn't this amazing? He allows us to grow as a global body, as a global family, 
every single nation, tribe, and tongue around the world. He allows us to grow up as believers and start to come together. And he thinks that's beautiful. He thinks you're beautiful. He thinks I'm beautiful. But he particularly thinks that all of us together are beautiful together. And he's allowing that for that to happen. And then he is allowing by his sovereignty for all the forces of evil to get really bad and then really bad and then really, really bad and attack us and try to kill us. And then whoop, he's going to come down riding a white horse out of heaven to save us. Hallelujah. That's another kind of salvation. But he likes that. That's what he's getting ready to do. I mean, he's got the white horse already, you know. He's got the armies there. And those guys are ready to come, you know. I mean, they're like, give us the word, Lord, and we're, you know, we're going to go down and chop those, those bad guys up. He says, no, 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 not yet. You know. And you know how the hero is. He's got to wait till the, till the beautiful girl is really stuck, you know. So she just gives up, you know, totally. And then he swoops in, and then she just loves him, you know. It's like... <laughs> Well, where did they get that from? This is it. This is the story. This is what's happening. Yeshua's going to allow us to be, to go through a difficult time, and, he, and we're going to cry. We're going to, Lord, all we want is you. And he says, come on, a little more, a little more, a little more. And then he's going to swoop in and save us. You know, sweep down, sweep up the girl, you know, and ride off forever and get married. I mean, that's, that's the story of creation. It's the only story that there is. What a beautiful thing. Now, during this process, the bride is being made ready. Now, some people say that we're not going to be here during the events of the book of Revelation. That doesn't make any sense to me because it's during those events that we are made ready. It's by going through those events that we are made ready. It's by going through difficult times that our faith is strengthened. It's by going through attacks that our hearts are purified. It's by going through suffering in this world before Yeshua returns that gives us a platform in which God can glorify us. You realize that God, God can't glorify us if we don't go through a process of suffering. He says, Paul said, I count the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us and through us. It's by him letting us go through that and maintain our love for him, which sets it up so that he can glorify us. Wow. So as we are being made ready, we have to be purified from the things of this world. We have to be prepared to rule and reign with him. And we have to go through sufferings so that we can be able to receive the glory of God come upon us and, have, and, and not have it ruin us. What an amazing thing. And that's what here to, we're to go through. And it could never have been shown to the human race. I think it's just right now, God wants to show us what his plan is for all of us together to glorify us. Let's look at the next verse. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. I'm just going to go through a few verses in the book of Revelation where we see the body of Christ, the body of Messiah there. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head was a garland of 12 stars. Now this is a symbol. Now the symbol is of a woman. Now the woman in this case represents the human race represents the church in Israel. I'll get to that in a moment. But it represents us as the people of God. The woman there is both men and women. All right? It's both of us together. We are a woman when, it, when we're facing Yeshua. We are his bride. So we have a feminine identity in that case, although we're both male and female in it. And then it says that, that, she, that she is clothed with the sun. That's a picture of us being glorified. Do you know what that means? That God's purpose for you and me is not just to have eternal life, but we get a new body. Now, I know you know this. We get a new body, a resurrection body that's not like this one. This one is like the dirt of the earth. But we're going to get a new body that's going to be like a star or, a sun, or the sun that will shine with light. There's two kinds of body. This is an earthly body, no shining. Then we're going to get a glorified body that's like a star and it will shine. So that's what means that we'll be glorified. We get a glorified body, each and every one of us. You with me? Now, and, and, but not everybody's glory is going to be the same. 
He, the, Paul said that our glory, each one of us, will differ like star differs from stars. Different stars have different magnitude of glory, and that depends on how you walk with him in this earth. And the thing that, and when you walk in faith through situations where you have to suffer through it, God doesn't want you to suffer. That's not the point. But he's giving you an opportunity to be loyal to him through difficult situations. And when you do that, something just starts to glow in his heart. Because you're going through that is what allows him, when you continue to believe in him and love him, even when it means a tax coming upon you, when you still love him there in the midst of adverse situations that make you suffer, that's what makes you ready to be glorified. Not just legally ready. It makes you characterize ready to handle the glory. If you can't handle the suffering, you couldn't handle the glory. Because if you can walk through the suffering, you say, look, that's, that doesn't make any difference to me. I just love you. And he says, well, then let's just add some glory to it. You really ought to get to the point. Here's the point, is that we should love him so much that we don't even see the difference between suffering and glory. What difference? I just want to be close to him. Well, it may suffer, it may be glory. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not put off by the suffering and I'm not in, in love with being glorified. I'm in love with him. And if you can love him and it doesn't even matter what you go through in this world, he says, well, then let's just turn that to glory because that won't bother you. Do you see what I'm saying? If the situation in this world can bother you and take you away from the love of God, you can't be glorified because your eyes will go on your own glory. We're glory because we're looking at him. And by going through difficult situations, what gives us the character to focus on him, whether good things or bad things are happening. And then if we do that, then he can give us the glory. But here this woman is not talking about you or me individual being glorified. You got this? He's talking about all of us being glorified together. Now, I'm stretching my heart and my faith to try to see this. You know, let's try to imagine this. We're talking about saints of God from East Asia, from Africa, from the Americas, from Europe, Arabs, Jews. We're all coming together. Indians, we're all coming together and we're all becoming one people together that are glorified. And, and this is the perfection of God's artwork. This is what he's carving. This is what he's painting. This is what he's building. It's an artwork, an art in process that he's been doing for 6,000 years. And the fact that it's taking 6,000 years is not a coincidence. Do you remember what happened in creation? God created Adam as an image of Yeshua and said it's not good for him to be alone. And he creates every other single thing in creation. I realize I'm talking to the choir here. But uh, he creates everything, uh, uh, everything else in creation, brings him all the animals, brings him everything. He's, How do you like all that? And he goes, ah, you know, pretty good. <laughs> I says, well, wait a minute, I've got one more thing for you. Lie down here for a minute. And he brings him, it brings him easy. He goes, wow, now this, now we're talking. But that's just, that's just a symbol. That's a symbol of what God is doing. That's what God is doing with the human race. The last part of creation, the last, it's not just on the sixth day. It wasn't even the sixth day in the morning. That's when we did the other Adam. It was the last part of the last day of creation when, when all of a sudden Adam sees Eve. And what that means is, are you listening to me, the last part of history before Yeshua comes back, which is the tribulation, which is the last part of the last day, it's during that time that all of a sudden, shoo, his bride is revealed to him. And Yeshua goes, now that's what I'm looking for. That's what I think is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing that God's making, and you and I are the pieces of this uh, mosaic. We are the piece, pieces of this tapestry. We are the living, it's a living tapestry of you and me in it. And it's got to be of every single type of per people group around the world. I'll give you another example. What would you say is the most beautiful physical item of natural creation? There's no doubt about it. What is it? It's a rainbow. There was no rainbow at creation. That happened at the flood of Noah. And what happened, you had that big judgment come, the flood over the earth, the destruction of evil, and then out of that, it said that the rainbow appeared in the clouds. See, it's, it's the last thing that appeared. Out of the judgment of the end times is going to appear the glory 
of the, body, of the bride of Christ. This is who we are. And it's got to be this. It's got to be together. It's got to be one. I mean, it's not a bunch of different colors floating all over the world. But it's also not all one color. Believe me, God doesn't want everyone to be Jews. He doesn't want everyone to be Arabs. He doesn't want everyone to be black. He doesn't want everyone to be white. He made us all different colors and put us together in this rainbow and then glorified us. Shining with light. The rainbow is God's covenant sign of what he wants to do with all the nations of the world. The, co the rainbow is the covenant, God's covenant, with all the sons of Noah of every tribe and every tongue and every nation. That's what he wants you and me to look like. That's his artwork. To him, it's more beautiful than the rainbow. Because the rainbow is just colors. He goes, that's nice, you know. And that's not what he thinks is beautiful. He thinks you're beautiful. He thinks you and I are beautiful. And when we all come together and we love one another and we can be who we are as different people and love one another and love him, then he can glorify us. And he says, now that's what I think is beautiful. That's the beautiful girl that he's coming back to rescue. Now, let's notice you here, notice here that he also says that the moon is under, his, under her feet. That's a sign of authority. God's not only glorifying us, he's giving us authority. This is our destiny as the human race since the beginning of time. And he allows for all the human race to be there because out of, that, out of the whole human race is going to come a group of people who are choosing and choosing and choosing to walk with him and to love him no matter what. And this is our opportunity. This is your opportunity to be part of this uh, hero program. This is, this is our time to be part of the superhero, you know, I don't know, Marvel, DC, something, Guardians of the, of the Universe or something like that, you know. But this is our part to be part of it. Now, here's something. I'm having a little trouble proving this, but I got this in prayer today. You can tell me if it's wrong. I was talking to my wife and I was telling her, you know, if you look at an action movie 20 years ago, it's not the same as they are today. I'll tell you what the difference is. 20 years ago, it's just the guy hero. You know, the girl is doing this during the whole movie. <laughs> and she's just looking, you know, that's all she does, you know. That's not the way it is today. You know what happens today? You know, the guy gets in a little trouble and she gets up and kicks the bad guys and shoots them and, can, and jumps off the buildings and just coming in. There may be a little bit of feminism in that, but I'm telling you, it's a, there's a godly part to that. And here's what I think it's saying. I think there's a message in that for that. Because, yes, Yeshua is coming back to rescue us. He's the superhero, and we're the beautiful girl that he comes back to rescue. But this is a modern one. This is a global family hero in which he gives us a part to play. Where you have a heroine part to play in this. You become a superhero girl. I don't know whether it's a Wonder Woman or a Supergirl or some kind, some jumping off the ship and, you know, killing the bad guys together with him. He wants an active heroine. Think about what, I mean, I think you all would really like that, you know. I mean, I did, you were believing that a long time ago. But anyway, Amen. God's calling us to be glorified and take part in this, in this plot, in this, the thick of the plot, the action movie. You've got a part of that. The global bride has got a part to play in this. And the only way we can get to those things, you, you, you have no, can you imagine a superhero movie where nothing went wrong? I mean, they're like sitting on the couch eating popcorn. I mean, it wouldn't be much of a movie, would it, you know? That's like after he's retired or something. I mean, even Indiana Jones is coming back after being 70, 80 years old. I don't know. But you, can't, you can't sit on the couch. If there isn't some action, there's got to be some danger. There's got to be some bad guy. There's got to be some attack. There's got to be something that demands courage and victory and, and sacrificing your life and jumping off of buildings. And, you know, that's what he's calling us to do, to share with him. It's exciting. I want you to be excited about this. I don't want you to be confused about it. I don't want you to be depressed about it. I don't want you to be afraid about it. I don't want you to be hesitant about it. I want you to say, this is your time to be a superhero. Glory to God. All right. Now, I just want to give you a few verses 
Because some things that make you confused is you have people say, well, there's, a, there's nothing for us to do in the book of Revelation. There's nothing about the church in the book of Revelation. I've got news for you. As far as I see it, there's more about the global ecclesia in the book of Revelation than there is in any other of the epistles of Paul, of any other, any other part of the Bible. This is where it all comes to pass. Because it is in the end times that the global ecclesia emerges and appears and is purified and prepared and walks with the Lord and is, makes herself ready for him to come back. So let's take a few examples. Of this. We'll run through this quickly. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And it says, And from Messiah Yeshua, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. He's making us kings and priests. A priest is someone who ministers to God, and a king is someone who rules over other people. So we have both a God direction and a people direction. He wants to give us a worshiping priestly role, but he also wants to give, give us a governmental role to rule and reign with him. Now we have, to, we have to go through a process, are you listening? We have to go through a process that we can be purified in our hearts to worship him as pure priests, and we have to go through a process in which we're being prepared to rule and reign with him. You can't get prepared to rule and reign with him if you don't go through tests. You have to go through integrity tests. You have to go through moral, morality tests. You have to go through responsibility tests. You have to go through submission tests. How can you receive authority if you're not willing to submit to authority? Whew. That's a sad thing. So many people want to rebel against authority. They don't realize they're cutting off their own authority. You get authority by submitting to authority. So we are being prepared prepared to receive authority by walking through this in these difficult times. We're being prepared to rule and reign with him because he's putting us through tests of integrity. Do you realize that the cross was Jesus' test of integrity? That was a light, yeah. You didn't get that one, huh? Listen, when Yeshua was on the cross, he did that for a couple of reasons. One reason was to, to save you and me. But there was another reason was to prove that he was the one who God had appointed to be the king. He had an oral message which he said, God forgive them of their sins, but he had a written message when he said, this is the king of the Jews. There were two things happening on the cross. Was God was setting in place your personal and my personal forgiveness of sins, but he was also setting in place Yeshua's authority as a king to rule and reign. And the only way you can be a king of kings is if you're also the king of a nation. So like if you're, you, you could, the king of the British Empire has to be the king of England before he can be the king of the British Empire. You got what I'm saying? So Yeshua comes in to Jerusalem, John 12, and he says, here he comes, he's the king of Israel. In the book of Revelation, we see him as the king of kings. But he can't be the king of kings if he's got to be the king somewhere before you can be the king of other nations. So Yeshua is the king of, Yeshua is the king of Israel. And from that position, he becomes the king of kings. Does that make sense? So you had to be, the, you had to be in the Roman Empire, you'd be the head, of, the head of the Italian government before you could be the king of kings. In every world empire, you had to be the, the head of one nation first, and then you become the king of all the other kings. So Yeshua is the king of Israel in the Gospels and becomes then the king of all the kings of all the empire in the book of Revelation. Where was I? So he, oh, so now, I know what I'm saying. The, the cross was his test. The Bible says that when Yeshua, by him being obedient on the cross, he proved that he was worthy to be king. Now, he had inheritance rights to be the king anyway. He had legal permission to be king because of who he was and he was born. But God didn't have him just appointed because of his lineage. He also put Yeshua through a test of being worthy. And when he was obedient unto the death, even unto the death on the cross, it not only saved you and me, it proved his worthiness to receive all authority and power. So while he, I mean, he just happened to be doing both at the same time, forgiving you of his sins, but proving he, that he himself was worthy to receive all power and all glory and all authority by what he did. Hallelujah. No, but, he, but in our lifetime, we also go through tests. 
to, to, so that he can transfer his glory, his worthiness, his authority into us by going through similar experiences. We walk in the footsteps of Yeshua that we can become like him, including the glory and the authority. Hallelujah. It's interesting here that the Hebrew version of this comes from Exodus 19, where he says, I will, make, I will bring unto myself, I will separate unto me from all the nations a special people which started with the Jewish people, but it was also a mixed multitude. He said, I will make them a special, a peculiar treasure. You remember that translation? It's a hard word to translate. I don't know how I would translate it. The word in Hebrew is segula. And the word segula means purple. Purple. You know what purple is? Half red, half blue. It's red because that comes from the ground. The word for ground in Hebrew is red. And the heaven is blue. So we are a special people that we have an Adamic and earthly nature and we have a heavenly nature and we walk together and therefore we can be priests both in heaven and on earth. We walk in his special calling that no one else can. No animal can do that. No angel can do that. But only we who were fleshly creatures who chose to walk in him and were born again of heaven that we carry both the heavenly and the earthly and we become God's special people. That's who you are. That's what he's called you to be. Now, he's called you and me to rule and reign with him. I just mention this quickly. It says it three times in the book of Revelation. One, it says in, in chapter 5, when we first believe in him, that we're called to rule and reign with him. When he comes back in chapter 19 before the millennium, it says he adds a word to this. It says we'll rule and reign with him for a thousand years. So he starts off telling us that we'll rule and reign with him when we get saved. And then when he returns, he says we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And then we get to the end of the millennium and he starts a new creation. He says, by the way, take that thousand years and change it to forever and ever. Hallelujah. So we rule and reign with him in this life. And then we rule and reign with him for a thousand years. And then we rule and reign with him forever and ever. That's what he's called you to be. And we go through a heroic story to get to that point that we can walk and walk with him. Hey, folks, this is not a couch potato thing. This is not watching it with, with the remote control. You gotta, you, you're part of the action. And that's how you get to be glorified, because you're part of the action. Hallelujah. Here's another verse. Revelation 2, chapter 7. Again, we'll just touch on it. Of course, there's one place of the church here. There's the seven churches, which I believe today are seven streams of churches. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, each of the different streams, God says different things. There's only two things that he says to every single congregation of faith. You know what they are? It's right there. Hear what the Spirit has to say to you and overcome. That's the universal message of Yeshua to every part of the body of Christ. Every other part, every other church, every other stream, he's, got, he's rebuking for this, he's encouraging for this, he's exhorting for this, he's giving different instructions because people are different. But there's one thing he says to everybody. Hear what the Spirit is saying to you and be an overcomer. That is his universal spiritual instruction to every person. Hallelujah. You know, we were, we were praying before we came down here with some of our friends and team members and we just thinking that, you know, Yeshua said in John 16, he said, you know, I have a lot left to tell you, but I can't tell you because you're not ready to hear it. And if you're like me, say, God, I want to be able to hear. What, what do I have to do to get ready to hear what you want to tell me? You know, what do I have to do to open my heart to listen to you? And he's given us the Holy Spirit to talk to us. And there's things that he wants to reveal to us now about the global family of faith, the global bride of Christ. Let's go on. Next verse. Here's, now, here's where it starts. You could divide the book of Revelation up into three parts. You have chapters 1 through 6, which are sort of general instructions to the church and to history. You have at the end, from 1911 through 2021 and 22 are things that happen in the future after Yeshua comes back. But then there's this middle part from chapter 7, verse 1, to chapter 19, verse 10, which is this period right in front of us until Yeshua comes back. This is what we have to go through. 
This is the important part for us to look at and study to understand this is what we as the saints of God are giving, being given instructions to by Yeshua for the end times. And here's the beginning of it. Chapter 7, verse 4 and 9. I heard the numbers of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Verse 9, and he says, A great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palm branches in their hand. Now, this is the beginning. The fact that there is a remnant of faith of Israel in existence today that there hasn't been for 2,000 years is a sign that this is getting ready to take place. This is the, is the pre-requirement for these central chapters of the book of Revelation to take place. The other thing has to happen is there has to be a great multitude from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. This can only happen. These events of the, own, of the end times can only take place when there is a remnant of Israel and there is a remnant of faith in every single nation of the world. Did you got that? Now, now what we believe is that God works in the remnant of every nation. In every nation, the majority of people are unbelievers and the minority, but there is a minority of faith in every nation. The minority of faith is called the remnant. That minority remnant holds the destiny for the whole nation. God looks at that. It might be two people. It might be three people. God says, that's, that's your nation. And I always tell this to people you know. If you want to understand the nation of Israel, don't look to our politicians and don't look to our generals and don't look to our rabbis. Look to the remnant of faith because we hold this destiny. And we live in a country, I don't know, our, our people are like, I mean, they're all like supermen. I mean, it's incredible. The politicians, the rabbis, the general, I mean, incredible. I mean, it's amazing. But, that, but God said, Yeshua said, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. And we hold, we may be weak, we may be beaten up, but we hold God's destiny for the nation of Israel. This is one of the reasons how I learned that God had a destiny for all the Arab nations. Because I can't look at the unbelieving or even Islamic majority of the nations, I look at my dear friends, the born-again, spirit-filled Arab Christians in every nation of the world, including Israel, including the Palestinian territories. These are the most beautiful people I ever met in my life. And I said, that is what that nation is about. It's not in the unbelieving majority. Are you listening to what I'm saying? People in America don't realize how the rest of the world looks at them. They see this, these unbelievably evil, sinful movies coming out and, and, and come in and they think that's America. Well, it might even be a large part of America, but it's not the true America. The true America is the born-again, spirit-filled ecclesia remnant of faith in this nation. And I want to tell you, you hold the destiny of America, not the, not the majority of the unbelievers. The minority of, of faith is what holds the destiny of your nation, and that's true. And that's true if it's in Indonesia. If it's in Nigeria, if it's in Brazil, it doesn't matter where you are. If in your Ukraine or Russia, if you're in China, it's the, it's the believing minority remnant that holds the, des the glorious destiny for the nation. And that's where you look to see. If you look to see that, you can see the personality. That's an amazing thing. Jane, you all would know this, but as you see people here from different nations of the world, it's amazing how people, born-again people in different nations of the world, keep their personality as they're a nation. I mean, Africans are Africans. If they get born again, they're more African than they were before. You know what I'm saying? Chinese people are more Chinese when they get born again. And I believe that we Jewish people and we Arabs, we're more Jews and Arabs when we get born again than we were before. We, hold, we, we, we blossom the personality that God has put in our nations. All right, let's go on. We're almost done. Revelation 15, 5. Well, we already did this today. 15, 2 and 3. Those who have victory over the beast. Hallelujah. Victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Oh, it's so scary. The beast. And the beast of the image of the beast. And the mark of the beast. And the number of the beast and the name of the beast. It's so scary. But there's people who have victory over that. 
standing on a sea of glass, having the harps of God. They sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Your praise is stronger than the Antichrist. Your praise is stronger than the Antichrist. Now, how is God going to show that to you? By letting you praise in an area where the Antichrist is. Come on, don't be afraid, folks. I, heard, I could feel some of you pulling back there from it. No, 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 no. He says, he says, I want to give you victory over the Antichrist. I want to show you that by your praising me, it won't touch you. He can't touch you. He's got a mark. Well, he's got a mark. Well, Jesus has got a seal. That 144,000 Jews and the great multitude from every other nation, he said, I'm not even going to start the events of the end times. I'm not going to start the events of the end times until my Messianic Jews, my Christian Arabs, my believing friends from Asia and America and Africa and Europe, until they're all sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then we'll start all the events. I'm going to give you a protective, a protective seal. I'm giving you one of those superhero, you know, uh, uh, uniforms to put on. Hey, man, you don't need a cape. You got a seal of the Holy Spirit. You don't need one of those superhero weapons. You know, you can just take your guitar out, you know, and start worshiping God. Your worship can overcome the beast. I didn't write that. I wouldn't have even thought of it. But that's what he wants to show us. He's going to show us, come, you've got a difficult time, start praising me. And we need to learn that, folks. Anytime darkness gets near us, I mean, you don't, have to get, you don't have to wait to get put in jail by the Antichrist, you know? Start, you know, you get up in the morning, you get depression, it jumps all over you. Start singing. It can't be there. There's no forces of Satan or the devil or the world or the flesh or the Antichrist. Nothing can be there while you're worshiping God. It has to flee. Amen. Two more verses quick, then we'll finish. Here we go. Revelation 17. Verse 15 to 17. Now, this may be a surprise to some of you. Now, the largest section of the book of Revelation is the judge, God's judgment upon the great whore. Two and a half chapters. Amazing. 17 and 18 in the first half of 19. Two and a half chapters. The largest section of the book of Revelation is about God's punishment and judgment of the whore culture. And we talked about that a little bit this morning. Let me just go over it. What the Bible calls the great harlot in the Greek is megasporne, which we would do, the way we would say it would be megaporno. It's a spirit of megaporno which we have around us. It's obvious. And it leaped up over the past few years. It leaped up with the whole uh, social media digital, digital uh, 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 ability to make pornography alive. It makes it, I mean, it, it went, I mean, even when I was a kid, when somebody wanted to see porn, I mean, you had to search, you know, get around and try to find a magazine. It might take you two hours to see one picture. You can't even turn on your phone today. The thing jumps out at you, you know. What happened? Where did that come from? We live in a world of mega porno. It's around, we have a culture particularly in America and in Europe and in, in most of the f what we're calling the free world, in most of the places where there's a lot of money. Because the money allows for it to be there. When you have liberty and money, then you have more ability for there to be p uh, uh, digital pornography. But, so God's kind of caught there because he blesses us. He wants to bless us with, with prosperity. He wants to bless us with communication. He wants to bless us with freedom of expression and freedom of religion. But that, oh, if he opens the door for us, that opens the door for the spirit of mega porno to come in. Stop trying to think that this spirit, that the great harlot is somewhere else, folks. Don't go looking for it. It's not, it's not hidden on some hidden faraway island somewhere out in the, in, the, in the East Pacific. I'm sorry, guys. It's on your cell phone. It's on your social media. It's on everywhere around you. It's all around us. And we've got to learn to fight it. This is the world. We live right now in the world of mega porno. Don't think it's somewhere else. If you think it's somewhere else, you're avoiding the issue. The issue is right here. The issue is right here focusing you. 
And there isn't, I'll talk to the men here for a minute, there isn't a man of God that doesn't, that isn't fighting this every minute of the day. We live in an environment that is soaked with, with sensuality and sexual immorality. That's the mega porno spirit. Now, there's two big evils in the end times. There is the mega porno and then there is the beast. They both have to do with the bride. Everything has to do with rescuing the bride. Do you see this? Now, the beast is there to try to kill the bride. You got that? And the, and the harlot is there to counterfeit the bride. The harlot is the counterfeit of the bride, and the beast is trying to kill the bride. You got that? Now, what happens here, the greater difficulty for us is not the beast, because the beast is obvious. The beast has violence. He's trying to kill us. There's no, there's no discernment that's needed for that. You know what I'm saying? The discernment is how we walk in purity. How can, now we're talking about men and women together. We are the bride. How do we walk in purity when the, when the environment, when the airwaves around us are saturated with sensuality and sexual immorality? And God is angry with it. Not, I don't think it's so much because of the sexual immorality itself, because it poisons us. Because it's counterfeiting us, because it's ruining our purity. It's ruining our passionate love for him. And says he wants to judge that. And he says to every single one of us, you've got to get out of that spirit. Part of being a believer in Yeshua is to separate yourself from the, from the vibrations of the harlot culture all around us. And that's how we have to be purified in this time. The bride has got to make herself ready. And the way she, first of all, we separate ourselves from it. The second thing that happens is, now this is, takes a lot of discernment. I don't know that anybody's walking in this right now. I'm trying to get there. I don't think I have it yet. But God brings punishment on the harlot culture. He brings judgment. He brings punishment. And as the bride, the holy bride, when we see the punishment coming on the counterfeit harlot that's trying to counterfeit us and trying to, and try to defile us, we ought to be rejoicing. And that's what happens in the second half of the book of Revelation. Every time they start to worship, it's God, we're worshiping for your judgment. We're thanking you, God. We're praising you for your judgment. Oh, what's his judgment on? His judgment is the punishment of the, uh, of the harlot culture, not the beast. That comes at the end. Oh, it got silent in here. Okay, now we have to think about this. We have to get so pure in our thoughts. I mean, I'm not there. I'm saying, I'm confessing. I don't want to be there when I see God's judgment on things that are, are harlot culture, porno culture, that we will rejoice and say, thank you, God, for your judgment upon our carnal culture that we've been part of. Wow. God said, I'm waiting for you. That Come on, start praising me. Start praising me. When you see something wrong going on in the world, stop for a minute. This could be God's judgment on the carnal culture around us. And if it is, not everything is, but if it is, then we need to praise God for his judgment. Now here's what happens. Verse 7, 15 to 17. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits, the, the pornographic spirit sits on something. That spirit, it, it sits on people's multitude, nations, and tongues. Did you get this? The harlot spirit, megas porne, sits on the multitude of nations, sits in their culture and their communication. The ten horns which you saw, that's on the beast, they will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. I hate to say this, I don't hate to say it, this is what the Bible says, that the beast culture is going to beat the harlot culture. This comes at the very, very end. But the culture of, of, of violence, of, of devastation and destruction, is going to destroy the culture of, the, of, of immorality and the breakdown of family values. And all. It's going to destroy that. And we're going to be there while that happens. And we've got to be praising God while it happens. How can we be praising God when the beast is beating the harlot? Because it says right here, for God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. 
God is going to bring judgment upon the harlot world culture. And amazingly enough, he's going to use the beast to do it. Now, I wouldn't have thought of that. You wouldn't have thought of that. But he's going to allow the beast to do it. Because the next thing that happens is he come, Yeshua comes back and destroys the beast. And what he's saying to this, uh, 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 us, we're the bride. He said, you get purified from that harlot culture. I'll take care of the beast. Don't worry about the beast. The beast is mine. I'll take care of him. I'll kill him. You watch him. That's I'm going to show you my superhero stuff by coming destroying the beast. But you've got to get separated from the harlot culture, and I'm going to allow the beast to destroy the harlot culture because the beast is too stupid. He doesn't understand the difference between the church and the world. He doesn't understand the difference between the harlot culture and the bride. He's trying to kill us. And God's going to use the, let him be stupid enough and kill the whole harlot culture and then turn to get us. And Jesus says, now's my turn. Now one last thing here is that you see the forces of evil are divided. Two big evils, the harlot and the beast, they're divided, they're going to kill each other. Well, the harlot, the beast is going to kill the harlot and, then, and Jesus will kill the, the beast. They are divided. Satan's forces are always divided. Le Jesus told us to pray. This is how you pray in spiritual warfare. Luke eleven seventeen. he says, the kingdom of Yeshua is united and standing and the kingdom of Satan is divided and fallen. You need to say that every day. Say it with me every day. I pray that every day. We need to pray that all the forces of Yeshua and righteousness and justice and the light are all united and working together and the forces of Satan and darkness and, and crime and immorality, they are fighting against one another. And we stand there. We stand there in the place. I want you to stand for unity. You need to pray this every single day. The, the kingdom of Yeshua is united and standing. And the kingdom of Satan is divided and fallen. Did you get that? One more time he said the kingdom of Yeshua is united and standing. And the kingdom of Satan is divided and fallen. Oh, you're getting it. Come on. The kingdom of Yeshua is united and standing. And the kingdom of Satan is divided and fallen. One more time. The kingdom of Yeshua is united and standing. And the kingdom of of Satan is divided and fallen. Woo, okay, now look. Why? Because when we first preach the gospel, we can learn to cast out a demon. But God's getting us ready in the end times to just cast Satan off this planet altogether. Not a demon out of a person. I mean, cast a whole bu a bunch of them off of this planet. Hallelujah. And that's why we need to be purified and be rescued. For you, you have got a role in kicking the devil off of this planet. You remember, I remember I taught this here 20 years ago about, the, about just shaking your head. The daughter of Zion, shaking her head and the forces of Antichrist just getting destroyed. So all you've got to do is say, hey, Jesus loves me. I'm his girl. No, you're not going to touch me. You remember what happened? That was in, that's in Isaiah 36. That night, Jesus came down and killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. He said, come on, give me a chance. I need you there. This is what it's all about. I'm going to put your part of this hero story. Come on. We are the girl. We are the beautiful girl that he's looking to come back. And he said, come on. Come on, I'm going to give you a part of fighting this with me here. Hallelujah. Amen. One last thing. No, no, that's it. Let's just see. Here's a, here's a uh, let's just do a quick summary here. God is making a beautiful people. This is God's artwork. We've got to make ourselves ready. What does that mean? We have to go through a process of being purified from carnality. To go through a process of being prepared to rule and reign with him. In order to do that, we have to go through difficulty. There is no way to be purified, and pu purified from sin and to be prepared to rule and reign if you don't go through a difficult situation. And we must be saved by our hero, Jesus, our hero, the Savior, the King, our husband, our nobio. And we must be one. And the church in Israel must become one. And this, us being ready, is the last requirement for Yeshua to return. Because it is the reason for him coming back. So I want us to run toward the future. Don't be afraid of it. I mean, it's, it's scary in the flesh. 
But we're not to be afraid. And we're going to say, this is what it was all about. Are you a little upset? It's okay. Yeshua said, right before he was crucified, he said, boy, he says, my soul is just, I'm upset. I'm disturbed. He said, but what? It was for this hour I was born. Sure, we're going to feel upset, but it was for this time that we were born. This is the time to be glorified. This is the time to be part of the hero story. God's purpose is for you to be glorified. Hallelujah. And I want to pray that for us. I want us to have a vision of us being the global body of Christ, the global bride that we're going into these end times, sealed with the Holy Spirit, worshiping the Lord, prayers rising up in heaven, coming down like fire. I mean, all, there's so much good stuff in there, guys. Come on. That book is a book about victory. He said every single thing you're going to hear from the Holy Spirit in the end times is how to, uh, is how to overcome. I'm going to walk you through these difficulties and show you how to overcome. And you're going to come out the other end of this so fearless, so overcoming, so courageous, so purified, so integrity, so overcoming that I can just glorify you. And then we're going to go on to the rest of eternity living happily ever after. Hallelujah. Stand up. I want to pray to bless you. I want to ask the worship team to come up. Now, what I want to do is bless you with the ironic benediction. And let me, dare, let me dare say that you probably don't understand it. Let me take just one minute here to explain it. When you see the word presence in the Bible, do you know that there is no word for presence in the Bible? It's not there. What it says in the Hebrew every time, hold on to your seat, the word in Hebrew, it says face. It says, let your face go with us. That's the word, that's the word that gets translated as presence. It's also true in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Greece, it's prosophon. It's, the, it's his face. It's an intimate walk with him. That's what we're talking about. And what the Aaronic benediction is, blessing you with two things, intimate relationship, face-to-face -face relationship. Let your face be lifted up into my face. It's talking about you being blessed with an intimate face-to-face -face relationship with Yeshua as his bride. If you could ask for any blessing, would you take that one? Yeah. Sure you would. Then he, then he says, but he said, let your face shine. It's being glorified. These are the two things that are being prayed for in that. That you have face-to-face -face intimacy and that you, your face will begin to shine with glory with his face shining. That's what I want to bless you with. Face-to-face -face intimacy and shining with the glory of his face. That's how I want to pray for you. Uh, in order for me to do that, this is my last time with you, I just want to, would you mind trying to get a little closer to me? I recognize this is a place is full, but just come up as close as you can. Let's end with that. Come up as close as you, if you get a little bit closer, jam up close to the front, and let me just pray this blessing for you. I want to pray a spontaneous prayer for you to be blessed as the glorious bride of Christ. And then I want to pray the Arenic benediction, and then we'll sing the blessing over you. Come up, squeeze up a little bit closer. Wow, so beautiful. Hallelujah. Get up as close as you can. Wow, wow, wow. I'm almost close enough where I could hug everybody here. Here's Sandra, you're the person here with it. <laughs> I knew you'd be the first one up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's just pray for a moment right now. Let's just open our hearts. Father, we ask you, Lord, I think this was a nice teaching, but that's not the point. Lord, you're trying to birth something right now. Something has never happened in the earth. There was never an opportunity for the global bride, the global body of Christ, the global family, the glorified bride to arise. The conditions just weren't there. It happens at the end. A woman gives birth at the end. Eve is brought up to the end. The bride is glorified at the end of the book of Revelation. Lord, something's happening right now. I feel like the Lord would say to us that we're getting diverted by so much bad news in the news, in digital, in the internet, in, the internet, in, in all what's going on. You're missing the point. 
God's allowing those tools to take place because he's allowing international communication between the saints. Don't get diverted by that bad news. He's trying to show us something. Don't get diverted by all the, 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 the counterfeits and all the attacks because in the midst of that, God is doing something. He's raising up a global body and you are part of it. He's letting his glory rise. He's letting his glory rise among his people from, the, from East Asia and to Africa and to the Americas and to Europe and into the Middle East. This is the time. Don't let yourself get diverted by all the bad news. Focus, concentrate upon his face that you can see what he's doing. And what he's doing is you. He's making you to be his glorious bride. And Father, I pray for us to change. I pray for everyone here, for your heart to be enlarged. God wants to bless you. He loves you personally. But he's got bigger blessings than that. Don't get so hung up on every little comfortable blessing you need for this day. God will give you that anyway. I just want to pray this little blessing upon you. You know, there's something you can do to make everything in, the, in, the, in heaven and earth and on under the earth work together for your good. Yes. Two things. You've got to love God, but you've got to be called according to his purposes. That means his plan, what we're talking about here. That's where you make everything work together for your good. It's not by praying, God bless me, I'm uncomfortable, help me with this, help me with that. That's not going to get everything working together for you. When you say, Lord, I love you and I dedicate my life to the kingdom of God. I dedicate my life to the, glo to the, glo to the global body of Christ. I dedicate myself to your purposes. Then everything starts to work for your benefit. You don't even have to pray those other prayers. No matter what happens, you say, hey, this looks bad, but it's all working together for my good. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I just pray right now for an expansion of our, of our ophic, horizons as we are looking. That we're not just praying about how I can have a comfortable day. Although God wants that for you. He'll bless you. But we're praying for his plan. His purpose, his, his kingdom. We're getting aligned with his kingdom. And when you do that, everything's going to walk in. Lord, uh, fit together for your good. Lord, I pray right now for everyone here for their vision to be expanded. To, sit, to look in every situation and say, what's God's plan? Not, not how do I get through this and get blessed tomorrow. But what's God's, what's he doing here? And how can I get right in the center of it? I pray for our hearts to be expanded. I've walked through this as I've walked through this walk with Abraham, our father. When he had to expand his heart, all he wanted was a son. He's 100 years old, doesn't have a son. And God says, just, 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 just one more thing. Two more things. First of all, pray for Ishmael. Secondly, just a little thing. I want you to be the father of all the nations of the world. Just open your heart a little bit. That's a lot of heart stretching. And I, I pray, Lord, for everyone here. I know it's part of the DNA of a glow. It's already there. I just want to expand your hearts a little more to love all the nations of the world, to have the heart like Abraham, our father, who loved all the nations. He said, yes, God, I'm, I love you so much. I'm willing not only to sacrifice my son, I'm willing to have a father's heart of love for all of the nations of the world, for every people group. And God said, that's it. I'm going to change your name. And you're going to be the father of faith to every nation. And now I'm going to give you what you asked for for yourself. Father, I just pray for right now for us to have this love for the global family of faith. To say, this is our people. This is our people. You know, they came to Yeshua and said, you know, your mom and your brothers are outside. He said, no, 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 this is my family. This is my family. Those who are hearing the word of God. There's an intimacy more with brothers and sisters who are hearing the word of God together than there is with your own blood family. And of course, we can have both. We can have both blood family and walking in the spirit. But we have that intimacy with Yeshua, which is greater than anything. Hallelujah. Father, I pray right now for us to be part, becoming the global bride of Christ. Yes. The purified, 
bride of Christ, the prepared bride of Christ, the glorified bride of Christ. Lord, that we go into this adventure that we're about to have. Hallelujah. And say, we read the end of the book, we win. Hallelujah. Come on, make my day. Make my day. Come on. I know we win. And I got the hero who loves me. And Yeshua, I just want to tell you, Lord, I have this heart. I want them to feel this heart, Lord. That you want to see him come back as a hero. Come on. He's our superhero. I want you to see him save you, to come swoop down out of heaven and rescue you. Come on. Yes, he died for our sins to give us eternal life, but he's going to swoop down from heaven and rescue us from the forces of the beast and the Antichrist and, the, and just kill all the bad guys. Hallelujah. And then say, come on, you want to get married? Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, I just pray for that kind of love and that we're going to say, wow. This might be a carnal example, I'm sorry. I read an interview with Gal Gadot in Hebrew. You know who she is, the girl that plays Wonder Woman? And she said, she said, you know, one day I was at home and I got a call from Hollywood and they asked me, would you, would you consider playing Wonder Woman for us? And she said, are you kidding? I get to play Wonder Woman? Folks, you get to play Wonder Woman. You know? I'm not talking about Wonder Woman. I'm talking about we get to be a part of the heroic story of Yeshua. You get a Supergirl part or a Wonder Woman part or whatever it is. You get to be a woman superhero. We, I do. We all get to be part of this story. Yeshua says, I'm coming back to save you. But you know what? I want you to be part of it. Let's do this adventure together. Come on, sweep in. I'm going to take you through this. We're going to walk through this dangerous place together. And Father, I pray for everyone here to have an energy to go through. Come on, I get to be part of this. I don't have to just go and watch this in the movie. I get to be the one playing in the story. Come on, come on. I want you to be more excited about being the glorified church in the end times than Gal Gadot is about playing Wonder Woman. Hallelujah. Yeah. I think there was one more thing there. Hold on. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Our Lord, and we just pray right now as so we get ready for the ironic benediction that this is what this prayer is. May you have face-to-face -face intimacy with Yeshua and may you become glorified because his face is glorified. It gets passed into you by that face-to-face -face intimacy. His glory passes into you. Those are the two blessings that I want to bless you with with the ironic benediction. At the end. Father, I just pray to bless my dear saints here, my dear sisters and brothers who have this heart for the global glorified bride of Christ to arise in glory, glory rising at this time in history that could have never happened even a year ago. This is something that is emerging across the nations. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father, that we get a part in it. We get to go through the adventure, and when we come out the other side, Lord, I pray that we'll be ready. We'll be purified, we'll be prepared, and we'll be, be glorified as this body. Hallelujah. I just pray for you to receive this blessing, face-to-face -face intimacy, and the glory, you're receiving his glory in his face. Vaishmarecha Ya Eradunai Panavilecha Vihuneka Yusadunai Panavilecha Vaisemlecha Shalom